So I'm really honored and pleased to be here today, and I've worn my cheerful clothes instead of my New York black for a change. Um, and this is my third book about a, uh, a hundred-year-old from the Social Register. My first book, which I spoke about yesterday, was about Brooke Astor, who uh, married her money. Uh, my second book was about Huguette Clark, who um, inherited her money. She was a copper heiress. And my third was about Bunny Mellon, who had the good fortune to both inherit her money and marry her money. <laughs> and her, uh, of, of all the people I've written about, she was the wealthiest. Her executors told me that her estate was worth more than $700 million. Now, these women were all born at the beginning of the 20th century, and they had a couple of different things in common. Um, they, uh, they all were really involved and loved art. Uh, Brooke Astor was on the board of the Metropolitan Museum. Huguette Clark was a very talented painter whose paintings were in the Corcoran. Now, I know that you know that Bunny Mellon and her husband, Paul, uh, amassed an amazing art collection that they donated <coughs> most of it to the National Gallery of Art and some to the Virginia Museum of Fine Art. But what you may not know was that Bunny loved to sketch. And as part of the book, I was able to include some of these really wonderful sketches that she did. She and her best friend, Jackie Kennedy, took sketching lessons. And I think it'd give you a bit of a whimsical sense of her personality. <clears throat> the other thing that all these three women had in common was that um, when they were over a century old, they were all involved in headline-making scandals. And that's where I come in. <coughs> <laughs> in the summer of 2011, I got a call from Newsweek magazine asking me to do a story on Bunny Mellon. And at that point, what I knew was, I knew she had designed the White House Rose Garden for her good friends, the Kennedys. I knew she was famed as a sort of style icon, as a um, landscape um, garden designer, um, that she'd been married to one of the richest men in America, and that she was someone who had really valued her privacy. And she'd really been out of the headlines at that point for maybe almost half a century. But as you may remember, the summer of 2011 was the summer of the John Edwards scandal. <coughs> uh, the North Carolina senator, uh, presidential um, contender, um, he had been indicted and charged with accepting illegal campaign contributions from Bunny and from another lawyer, which he was charged with using to support his pregnant girlfriend and then their baby. So suddenly, he's going to be on trial, and Bunny is in the headlines. Helicopters are buzzing her farm. She lived in a 5,000-acre farm in Upperville, Virginia, which is about eight miles south of Middleburg, for anybody who knows Virginia. And <clears throat> everybody wants to talk to Bunny. And when Newsweek asked me to talk to her, I kind of laughed. I said, you know, why would she talk to me? But I said, I'll try. And what I had learned from my previous books is that if you want to reach someone of this social class, you don't, um, you don't call them, you don't email them, you don't fax them, you don't text them, you send them letters on beautiful monogram stationery, which is what I proceeded to do. <coughs> now, there was one thing I thought going in that might be helpful to me, which is that I knew John Edwards. A decade earlier, I had done one of the first major magazine stories when he was newly elected to the Senate, was already talking about running for president. I had become friendly with his wife, Elizabeth, who many of you know later died of breast cancer, but we'd actually spent time together in Washington on the campaign trail. And then here's something that I'm almost, not almost, I am embarrassed to admit now. There was a moment before he lost his mind that I thought John Edwards would have been a good president. <coughs> um, so I wrote, when I wrote to Mrs. Mellon, I, you know, I mentioned that I had known John Edwards a little bit of this. A couple days passed, and I didn't really think anything would happen. And then the phone rang, and there was this very high-pitched voice on the phone. It was Bunny Mellon. And she said, you wrote me such a nice note that I thought I would call you myself to say, I'm not going to talk to you. <laughs> <coughs> well, yes, you're all laughing, and I figured that she wouldn't have called if she didn't want to talk to me, which then she proceeded to do. She gave me an interview, and I was able to talk to her grandson, Thomas Lloyd. I called her longtime lawyer, Alex Forger, who had also been Jackie's lawyer. Bunny had had everybody sign confidentiality agreements, but she told Alex that you know, it was okay for him to speak to me. So I wrote the story, and I heard from mutual friends that she had been pleased with it. 
And a couple of months later, I woke up on Thanksgiving morning, and I thought, how many 101-year-olds do I know who still seem to be all there? <coughs> so I called her just to wish her a happy Thanksgiving, and she seemed so pleased that somebody thought about her and remembered her. And we had this sort of interesting, rambly conversations, because one of the things I'd been really interested when I'd done research, and I'd gone to the National Gallery to look at some of the art, was that Bunny was a very, um, had fallen in love with Rothko very early on. So I asked her about buying the Rothkos, and she was telling me how in 1970, shortly after Rothko had committed suicide, her dearest friend, Hubert de Jamashi, had said, you know, you must buy Rothko, let's go together. So she was telling me how they went to the studio, and she was just entranced by these paintings. She called her husband to say, I want to buy Rothkos, and he was very dismissive. Um, Paul, Paul had fallen in love early on with British paintings, Stubbs, Constables, Sargent, he would later credit Bunny with getting him involved with buying Impressionists, but he really didn't like modern art. So Bunny did a little arm twisting, and he agreed. She bought seven Rothkos, <laughs> and you know that was well before they were well below the six figures. Um, and he put them in Bunny's name, which turned out to be very helpful to her later on in life, <laughs> which I'll come back to. But so we had this really kind of just lovely rambling conversation. She was just talking to me about, you know, I loved Rothkos. Um, and so I got off the phone, and if this were a movie, calendar pages would now be turning in the breeze. Um, <laughs> Bunny died in March 2014, and I was invited by her family members to go to the funeral, which I really wanted to do, but I had a problem. I have elderly parents in their 90s, and I had bought air tickets months earlier to go visit them. And I said to my husband, what do I do? He said, if you have any interest in writing anything about Bunny Millen, you have to go. Not only do you have to go, but I will go with you. I will drive you. I will wear a chauffeur's uniform and hang out with the other chauffeurs, <coughs> which she did not need to do. But um, the funeral was actually a really extraordinary experience. I later discovered that Bunny, like some, you know, some people do this. Um, she had a whole file. She had planned her funeral to a fare thee well. She had the guest list, uh, the pallbearers, the hymns. Um, you know, the refreshments back afterwards. But there was one thing she really couldn't control in this funeral, and that was the emotions that kind of burst out in the course of this two-hour event. It began, and I only understood some of this later on, when John Edwards decided he would come to the funeral with his daughter. But Bunny's stepson, Timothy Mellon, had told the family the night before, he's a Republican, among other things, and he said that if you know, John Edwards walks into this church, I will punch him and walk out. <clears throat> so at the door, um, there was the minister saying, oh, Senator Edwards, come on in, come on in. And there was the family, you know, person behind the family saying, no, no, overflow room, which is where he ended up. So that was in the beginning. And then Bunny, um, Bunny was married twice, and her first husband was a man named Stacy Lloyd, Jr. And she had two children from that first marriage, Eliza and Stacy. Now, I have to say, this is a family with many nicknames. Uh, Bunny's given name was Rachel after her mother, and her nurse said, what a cute little bunny, and she became Bunny the rest of her life. Bunny's son, Stacy, had been born a blue baby, umbilical cord wrapped around his neck, and his, his father kept saying, what a tough baby. He became Tuffy for the rest of his life. So Tuffy was the first speaker, and he got up, and he gave this really emotional, you know, how much he loved his mother, but also talking about the time when his parents were married to one another and how he remembered, and that was kind of like Paradise Lost, and how after the war his parents were squabbling about money. And then he said, and the man was then, Tuffy was then 80 years old, he said, and then my mother met another man, Paul Mellon. And I'm thinking, oh my God, it's 2014? You know, Bunny married Paul in 1948? He's still <laughs> mad about this, you know? <laughs> so I thought, oh, this is interesting. And then he has um, two sons, uh, Stacy and, and Stacy the Fourth and Thomas, and the two brothers got up. And it became very clear that they had very different relationships with their grandmother. And there was sort of a sense that one was close and one there was tension. And I thought, well, this is also kind of interesting. And then um, the actor Frank Langella got up. And he had been friendly with Bunny's daughter, Eliza, from her first marriage. And he talked about how when he was 23 years old, 1961, he was his first job at the Cape Cod Playhouse as an actor. 
and Eliza was there, you know, working in behind the scenes and helping out. And Bunny came one day to see Eliza, met Frank, liked him. And a couple days later, he said, um, Eliza said, Mummy wants you to come to lunch. And Frank said, I'm from Joycey. What's a mummy? <laughs> so he talked about how he cleaned himself up and took his, you know, third-hand station wagon and drove to Bunny's and Paul's amazing mansion in Osterville in Cape Cod. And here were the other guests for lunch. Noel Coward, Adele Astaire, and President and Mrs. Kennedy. <laughs> he said it was quite an experience for a 23-year-old. <laughs> but he talked about really their, their really long friendship and how much it meant to him. And then at the very end, it had been a rainy, gloomy day. Um, suddenly, it was like this, um, they were in the, this gorgeous um, Gothic church, Trinity Church, that Bunny and Paul had built in Upperville. I encourage you, if you're ever there, it's just really spectacular. They, they made the um, stained glass windows were from, w uh, Bunny brought the glass over that had been ruined in churches during the war. Um, so suddenly, um, the sun comes through the stained glass window, and Bette Midler got up to sing The Rose. It was really quite something. Um, Bette's assistant later told me how Bunny had called, probably 10 years earlier, to say, you know, will you sing at my funeral? And it was like Bunny was planning a party. She just wasn't going to be there. So after the uh, funeral, we, my husband and I went back to Bunny's farm where they had this, you know, again, everything was perfect, little topiary. Some of you know Bunny was famous with topiaries on the table. And at that lunch, Bunny's grandson, Thomas, came to me and said, we'd like you to write the book. Now, this never happens to a writer. <laughs> and, and what was really unusual about this is that my book is not an authorized book. The family did not see the book until it came out. I was given access to, Bunny was one of these people who saved everything. I mean, report cards from Foxcroft, um, letters her grandfather had sent when she was 12 years old, letters from Jackie, um, five boxes of Givenchy letters. Every time Paul Mellon gave her a, um, a painting, he would write these little notes with the painting. Um, Under your pillow, you'll find a utrillo. It's great stuff. <laughs> uh, <coughs> so I, I'm really happy to say that I, you know, um, her family also knew that Bunny was in many ways complicated, difficult, and they were like, write the truth. So I'm happy to tell you that um, Thomas Lloyd gave a book party for me, and Tim Millen, um, who had threatened to walk out of the church, came to me, and he had a difficult relationship with Bunny, and he said, you got it right. So I'm, I'm relieved because, you know, you never know. I, you, you, want, you hope the family likes what you do, but you also have to write the book that you see. Now, when I began working on the book, there were a couple things that, um, that uh, became obvious quickly. The first thing was, funny stories about people who have too much money. <coughs> um, Bunny, Bunny had this eye about how she wanted everything to be. So she had her staff serve laced potato chips, but take out all the broken pieces beforehand. <coughs> um, when she was flying to Cape Cod, they would call in advance and tell the gardeners to rake up all the leaves and put back the really pretty ones. <laughs> She put in a pool in Antigua, and then after it was done, she decided the shallow one should be where the deep end was. She made them jackhammer up and start all over again. <coughs> so, but it was really, oh, when um, she also had a home in Nantucket. Bunny, Bunny had many, in addition to the 5,000-acre farm in Virginia, they had two houses in Washington, one just to hold Paul's paintings. They had a double townhouse in New York. They had this estate on, on Cape Cod, and then Bunny used a legacy from her father to buy her own place on Nantucket. And they also had an apartment in Paris. So they really had amazing numbers of places. But um, um, when Bunny discovered she couldn't, trees wouldn't grow in Nantucket because it was too close to the beach, she had carpenters build fake wooden trees and planted them on the grounds to, for visual interest. <laughs> but even as I was getting these sort of fun, quirky stories, um, Oh, and one more. Um, I don't know, some of you may know of a woman named Dita Blair. Her husband was an ambassador. She's a philanthropist. Well, she, like Bunny, were both great clients of Givenchy. And Dita was telling me how, you know, Bunny and Paul were wonderful gift givers, but they could, she could be a little bit on the quirky side. And Dita said she got a call from Bunny saying, I know you're going to go to Paris. You're going to see Givenchy. Could you bring a little gift for me? And Dita said, of course. And this gorgeous little package arrives, and Bunny is so, you know, 
concerned about it getting there that she tells Dita, my driver will pick you up at the airport in Paris, drop you off and take the package. Um, so Dita said she saw Givenchy a couple days later and she, she couldn't help it, she was really curious. You know, was it Jalombergé cufflinks or what was in the package? Bunny had found the perfect stone on a beach and she <laughs> that was what was in the package. <laughs> And I said, you know, weren't you, was he disappointed? He said, no, it was a gift from Bunny. Um, but at the same time, I began to hear these stories that were a little more disconcerting. Um, as I had said to you, I sensed at Bunny's funeral that there was a lot of, there were some issues between her two grandsons. It turned out that Bunny, everybody maybe secretly has favorites, but Bunny played favorites overtly. She really just fell in love with the younger one, Stacy. And she was constantly, she would go to F.A.L. Schwartz and buy the place out, and his, little, his older brother Thomas would get a blanket. And there were really, she, she, she was mean-spirited in some of the things she did. Thomas mentioned that he and his wife were going to be driving from Virginia to Cape Cod, which was a five-hour drive with two little kids. So what does Bunny do? She calls his brother, who lives right near him, and says, would you like to use my plane to go to Cape Cod this weekend? And the brothers didn't find out what happened until they both saw each other in Cape Cod. And it was very painful to them. Thomas later in life became close to her, but he never knew. He kept thinking, did I do something wrong? And it was a huge issue for their father and his wife, and who really kept saying, Bunny, you're creating divisions in our family. Please don't do this. And she was like, I'm going to do what I want. And then I also found in her files, she had a habit of basically befriending people, she often became friendly. She wasn't necessarily in love with people from the social register. She liked artists and curators and gardeners. And she would take people up, and then one day, it would just be over. And there were a whole series of letters in her files saying, Bunny, I, I love you. I miss you. I don't know what happened. I call, and they say you're not there. I know you're there. Some of you may know of the famous um, hairdresser Kenneth. Kenneth wrote to say, you know, Bunny, I, I know this is going to happen someday because it happens with everybody, and please, you know, um, if I ever do anything wrong, please tell me because you matter too much to me. So I really began to wonder, you know, what was it in her that made her cut people off? Now, I don't know about the rest of you, but when I look back and try to figure out what happened in people's lives, I immediately go back to their childhoods. So, of course, I went back to Bunny's, and this is young Bunny. Now, I should stop for a second to say, Bunny was born into a really unusual and interesting family. Her maternal grandfather, Jordan Lambert, um, was from Virginia, went to St. Louis, uh, gone to pharmacy school. He licensed the formula to this new antiseptic, li antiseptic liquid that had been created. And he actually sailed all the way to England trying to, and asked a very famous surgeon whether he could use his name for this product. The surgeon was Sir Joseph Lister. Listerine. <coughs> so this family was immediately tremendously wealthy. Bunny's father, Gerard, was the fifth of six children, but it was also one of those families of, you know, heartbreak central. When Gerard was three years old, both of his parents died within weeks of each other, and the kids more or less raised themselves. He was brilliant, a genius. He would later go back um, and kind of, um, he went to Princeton. He was known for his, you know, his chauffeur to take him five blocks from on campus. I mean, he was kind of this very flamboyant character. But there was a period after uh, World War I where Listerine sales were really um, not doing well. And he'd gone back to work at the company, and he met with his brother and some people to say, you know, what can we do? At that point, it was only sold to dentists and doctors. And his brother Marion said, you know, Dad always said it was good for bad breath. And, and Gerard was like, that's so vulgar. But he went home, as the legend has, that hunt night. He stopped at an ad agency. He got a picture of a young woman. And he came back with what I think of as these Hall of Shame ads, which was the things her best friends won't tell her. <laughs> Always a bridesmaid, never a bride. Till breath do us part. <clears throat> and he helped turn this into, you know, turned around the, the fortunes of the company. Bunny was born in 1910 in New York. She was the first of three. Her mother was also named named Rachel, and she, um, younger brother, uh, again, many nicknames in his family. He was Gerard Jr., named Sonny, and then a younger sister named Lily, who was beautiful. Gerard was a very sickly baby, and their mother really doted on Gerard. 
when Lily was born, um, Bunny's father later wrote an autobiography in which he talked about how Lily was the most gorgeous child. Bunny was stylish, um, you know, I'll take beautiful. Um, and she always talked about the fact that her mother, you know, loved her brother, her father loved her sister, but she did have one great champion with her life, and that was her grandfather, Arthur Lowe. <coughs> that was her mother's father. Now, Arthur Lowe was a, um, a gingham manufacturer up in New England, a small town politician and mayor, but he was a great outdoorsman. That's why you see him with all of his fishing and hunting. And every summer, he had a farm up in New Hampshire. He would take Bunny up there, and that's where she really fell in love with nature. He would get her, you know, she had family with servants and all that at home, but he had her getting up pumping water. They would uh, sleep on the porch. He taught her the stars. She began planting gardens. He really was, and she would always write about him as the great influence of her life. Now, her father built this rather enormous place called Albemarle in Princeton, 200 acres. It still exists. I got to see it. And here's young Bunny getting her hair cut. And her father, I would later discover, really set the model for Bunny. He loved real estate. He loved gardens, and of course, he would have no one but the best design these gardens. He hired the Olmsted brothers, the sons of, yes, Frederick Law Olmsted. So Bunny described her early immersion gardening was literally trailing around the Olmsted brothers as they designed all of these places. Um, and that's Albemarle, and it looks very much like that to, it, to this day. <coughs> um, that's Bunny and her father. Um, he was a, he loved to sail. He would later uh, compete in the America's Club. What I love is they're on the boat. The white shirt, the tie, the whole, I mean. <coughs> um, Bunny went to Foxcroft and um, where her best friend was a young woman named Dorothy Kitteridge. I don't know if that rings any bells. Some of you, I see you nodding. Uh, Dorothy's brother also couldn't pronounce her name, so he called her sister. She would later marry Henry Parrish. So I love the notion these two 16-year-olds um, who would become best friends and both advise Jackie Kennedy were there at Foxcroft. What's interesting about their lives is <coughs> um, sister married first, and they might have been kind of a little bit equal financially going into life, but sister's uh, parents and her in-laws got wiped out in the stock market crash. So at age 23, sister had to open up a little decorating shop. We know how that went. <laughs> but it was interesting. Bunny, Bunny never had to work, but I think there was a certain jealousy of, they, they were a little jealous of each other because Bunny always had money, but sister got great acclaim. Now, Bunny really, <coughs> excuse me, really wanted to go to college. And when I got the Foxcroft yearbooks, I was kind of fascinated to discover, she graduated in 1928, that essentially many of her classmates did go on to college, but her father wouldn't let her do it. Um, this obsessed her. She became a voracious reader. She became a collector of rare books, which are now housed, 10,000 volumes of rare books in her library. But um, she, she was writing reminiscences that I was able to use in the book in her 90s about her childhood, and she was still talking about my father wouldn't let me go to college. But in 1928, her father did make one really <coughs> smart decision, which is that Listerine was doing really well, he was bored, the stock market was going great, and he thought, you know, I think I'd like to just sell, all the, sell everything I own and go sailing. And that's what he did. So in 1928, he sold his stock for $25 million, the equivalent of $340 million today. Bunny's coming out party was the weekend of the stock market crash. When I got the headlines, I couldn't believe it. But, you know, he didn't have to worry because he could live like a rich man. Um, Bunny's parents got divorced. Uh, father had a wandering eye. Um, both ended up remarrying. But during a period when he was on his own, he bought a, um, this historic mansion, Carter Hall, down in Millwood, Virginia, right near Foxcroft where Bunny had. And Bunny, for a while, was kind of the lady of the house, um, basically planting gardens, redecorating, um, and... Oh, that's Bunny and her sister. Sorry about that. The gorgeous Lily, you'll see um, with the, the neck thing. Bunny was attractive, but Lily was really pretty. Bunny is a young debutante, um, and that's Carter Hall, the rather extraordinary place. Bunny did get her Mrs. degree, and here she is marrying Stacy Lloyd. Um, but he was from a prominent Philadelphia family. 
Um, he had the kind of Mayflower thing going on. Her family was more well-to-do. She felt she kind of won the lottery by marrying Stacy. And they moved to Carter Hall, and then they built their own home behind it called Apple Hill, which is their first kind of major decorating project. Anne down there, and her, <coughs> her husband started a publication called The Chronicle of the Horse, which still exists. So he was a gentleman newspaper publisher. Now give me one second for a hit of water. <coughs> <clears throat> so there they are in Horsey, Virginia, and they become friends with the neighbors, also known as Paul Mellon and his wife Mary. <clears throat> and th there's Paul and Mary on their honeymoon, and there's Paul with his father, Andrew Mellon. I will go quickly over the, you, you could, well, the, many books have been written about the Mellons, but essentially, Andrew Mellon and his brothers and father built the extraordinary Mellon Pittsburgh banking, coal, every kind of fortune. Um, Andrew was treasury secretary under three different presidents. He married late in life to a much younger British woman, Nora. They had a child, Elsa, then they split up for a while, and then they got back together, then they had a child, Paul. When Paul was four, his parents went through what was then considered one of the most wrenching divorces. Um, there were private eyes, there were all sorts of allegations. Um, there was a heartbreaking picture of Paul, age four, um, when the divorce came through because his mother had gotten, I mean his father had gotten primary custody and he's holding on to his mother like this. He would later uh, discover, going through his mother's papers after um, his father had, or his father's papers after his father had died, that there were allegations that he was not his father's son that he was a product of an extramarital affair by his mother. This kind of drove him a little bit crazy. It was before DNA testing. He spent most of his life in analysis trying to kind of deal with this horrible family life. To <coughs> he was um, unbelievably charming, unbelievable gentleman. If you had met him in a social situation, you would have thought he was the kindest man in the world, but his family talked about the fact he had a dark side, he could be critical, he could be sarcastic, it was not, funny. he later not, did not have an easy time of it. Um, but anyhow, the, the couples were very good friends. Uh, during World War II, uh, Stacy Lloyd and Paul Mellon were both uh, working for the OSS in London, and they roomed together. One of the great fun things about writing this book was Bunny had saved all of her husband's letters. So there I am reading all these great World War II gossip as in her husband writing, I've just met this terrible gold digger, Pamela Churchill. <coughs> <laughs> but he was also writing about Paul Mellon's affairs, which is a little uncomfortable because, you know, Bunny was friends with Mary Mellon. Bunny, of course, began to wonder about her own husband was having affairs, so there are all those letters saying with her, you know, alas, her side of the correspondent was not, was not saved, but, but her, you know, her husband saying, Bunny, there's only you for me, you know, I'm, but, of course, you know, he was a long war. He was gone for a long time. He was a good-looking man. You, you figure it out. <coughs> um, uh, and this is, well, this is Virginia, but I'll come back to this. One of Bunny's lovely sketches. Um, after the war, both marriages were troubled. And Paul wrote about it in his autobiography that he and Mary felt they were complete strangers when he got back. Um, as Bunny's son had said at the funeral, Parents were arguing over money. Bunny was still very suspicious of him. Um, Mary Millen was allergic to horses, and she actually went herself, she got herself analyzed by Carl Jung in hoping that it was psychosomatic, but alas, it wasn't. She really wanted to stay married to Paul, and to stay married to Paul was to ride, to be around horses. This was his great passion. And in the fall of 1946, they went out for a ride, and on the way back, she had an asthma attack. And he went to get help. When he came back, she said, I just want to go home. And she died four hours later, oh. um, leaving two children, um, a, uh, a daughter, Kathy, and a son, Tim, who was four. Kathy was about 12. Now, this is the point where I always feel a little bit awkward talking about other people's marriages. But um, what I will say is based on conversations, things people wrote, <coughs> they even Paul Mellon wrote, um, Bunny and her husband were very solicitous of Paul Mellon, the widower. Bunny was really, really solicitous. <laughs> um, you know, here was this man who was distraught, you know, small children, kind of didn't. 
Uh, she'd also took a long look in the mirror. She was in her mid-30s. She'd never been gorgeous. Paul was erect. She knew that the minute he came out of his despair and grief, he would be one of the most eligible men in America. So she made herself indispensable. And ultimately, um, she divorced her husband to marry Paul. Her husband, Stacy, could not believe that she didn't love him anymore. I mean, some of his letters to her were so poignant. Um, but she wanted, she was ready for a different life. And I, I don't think she entirely married Paul for his money. I think that she always said they were friends, and she really thought that sh she could help him with his world and his life. And she certainly did, because at that point, he was just stepping into taking over the Andrew Mellon Foundation that had hundreds of millions of dollars to give away. And Bunny and Paul had very similar interests, historic preservation, education during the civil rights movement, giving hundreds of millions of dollars to historically black schools and diversity scholarships to other schools. So Bunny was really by his side during this early part of, um, but she also, you know, this is where she moved to. This is Rokeby Farm. She, I think she fell in love as much with the land and with the different life she could have. Um, these are, this is Bunny and the children. On the right with the thing around her neck is Eliza Lloyd, Bunny's daughter. Next to her is Tim Mellon, Paul's son, Bunny in the center, her son, um, Tuffy Lloyd, and Kathy Mellon. Um, a tip to future writers and biographers, if you really want to know about your subject, talk to the in-laws. Uh, John Warner, former Senator of Virginia Warner, was married to um, Kathy Mellon, and he was a great interview. He still, d he came from the book party, remarkable man, but he talked about how um, Paul Mellon's children really felt that Bunny played favorites with the kids, just did not give enough attention. Um, and I also heard from um, Bunny's uh, son's ex-wife that, you know, there was a lot of, um, there was also just a lot of, um, oh, Bunny built a new house for, um, she took farmhouse and land and she put it in other rooms. And her son, Tuffy, came home from boarding school and he discovered something interesting. No room, yeah. yeah. Her mother had put her in a separate building above the garage. And maybe she thought that would be great for a teenage boy, but he felt he had been isolated. So the kids weren't particularly happy. But in the early years, Bunny and Mellon were having the time of their life and they began building this extraordinary art collection. And that's them a little bit later in life with a private plane, but Paul put an airstrip on his property so they could take off it at any time. Um, here are some photos from Sotheby's from the auction. You'll get a sense of the, which is a beautiful house that Bunny put together, um, all her garden things. Um, again, one of the joys of this book is I got to spend a lot of time down at the uh, Bunny's place. Um, and of course the art collection, this, these, are now at the National Gallery, but we zip right through Van Gogh. Just kind of one amazing painting right after another. Bunny's topiaries, <coughs> the Rothkos, um, the jewelry. Suddenly, Schlumberger and um, uh, Verdura are competing to, I mean, it was amazing. She became obsessed with Schlumberger. She, she, they told me at Tiffany, she bought everything he ever made. And she didn't take the stuff home at times. She just kept them in the vault there. She just had to have it. Now, Bunny's life did change dramatically when Queen Elizabeth made her first visit to America in 1957. She only stopped at one private home, the Mellons. And um, that same year, uh, Adela Stair, the older sister of Fred, uh, was then living in Virginia near uh, Bunny, and she thought that Bunny might like to meet this young friend of hers, the uh, wife of a senator, Jackie Kennedy. And Adele brought Jackie to tea at Bunny's, and uh, Jackie called Bunny the next day and said, I love everything about your house and I hate mine and will you come and help me? And that was the beginning of a lifelong friendship. Um, Jackie was 19 years younger than Bunny, but they remained incredibly close. Lee Radziwill said, I said, were they like sisters? You know, we're, no, we're like mother daughters. You know, they were like sisters. And Caroline Kennedy was kind enough to allow me to use something she wrote about Bunny and she just talked about they were like mischievous children together with a secret language all of their own. She said, I always loved it when I could hear my mother on the phone with Bunny because she would be laughing and I knew that Bunny would be taking care of her, that my mother would have someone who cared about her. Um, 
And now, without, yes, this is a pictures of the rather extraordinary day in 1961 when President Kennedy asked Bunny to design the White House Rose Garden. Photos taken by Catherine Graham, who was at that lunch. Um, when I was working on the book, I thought, what can I possibly say that has not been said about the Rose Garden? And as I mentioned, Bunny had been thinking about writing an autobiography, and she had written scribbly little notes on various things, you know, I was trying to decipher it. And I'm reading, and she would jump around. I was reading one chapter about, or one, one sort of essay about the birth of her son, and suddenly, the next page, it was the day that she got, you know, that this happened. And she wrote about how, I'm going to try to set the scene. She's in her bedroom upstairs um, at their Cape Cod place. She's looking out at the water, and she can hear the chatter of the staff downstairs. And they're all very excited. The, the cook, Cora, is making corn soup, which the president loves, that he's coming for lunch. And that uh, she doesn't want to do a, a formal lunch in the dining room. She thought what he'd really like would be a picnic on the beach. So she's sitting there thinking about the day, and the phone rings, and it's Jackie. And Jackie says, you know, we're about to go to church, and then we're coming, but I, I want to tell you, Jack's going to ask you something today, and you have to say yes. So Bunny says, well, he's going to ask you to design the White House Rose Garden. I have to go. <laughs> Bunny said she was, like, totally floored. She said, you know, my father wouldn't let me go to landscape architecture school. I've never done anything like this. How can I possibly do this? And she said she then thought of her grandfather, Arthur Lowe, and thought, you know, he always, he was patriotic. He said, if I could ever do something... So she said yes. And she had a number of adventures doing this. <coughs> this is one of her beautiful sketches for the Rose Garden. And what's interesting is they have not changed the design since then. I mean, when you see, you know, President Trump, when you saw Obama, everyone in the last, you know, ha half a century, they're still in the same design that Bunny designed, which became so famous. Now, just before they were doing the big dig at the White House, um, Bunny had brought in a man named Perry Wheeler, who's a famous um, landscape designer, had done Mar Marjorie Mer Merriweather's posts. And um, Perry's letters are saved at the Smithsonian Garden Library. And <coughs> Perry wrote to Bunny to say, you know, I met with the National Park Service. They're very concerned about your plans to put in these magnolia trees that will be right next to the White House because they're very worried about some of the, um, the wires underneath. And they wanted to change the plans. And I said, oh, no, you know, Mrs. Mellon would have to redo everything. The president wants it. He said, so I won. Um, the dig begins. And Robert Kennedy later described how there he was with his brother in the Oval Office. And suddenly there was in this enormous commotion, bells ringing, fires going off, because the garters had cut through the cord to the Strategic Air Command. <laughs> <laughs> they could have set off a nuclear attack. <clears throat> um, Bunny was by Jackie's side through kind of every major occasion. Um, this is them going to uh, Noel Coward play, and the right later is for RFK's um, at, Mar at Arlington Cemetery. When um, the president was assassinated, Bunny was in Antigua. She flew back immediately, was kind of summoned by Jackie to the White House, and Jackie asked her to do something that no civilian had ever been asked to do, which was to do the flowers for the rotunda where the president's body would be held in state, for the church and for Arlington Cemetery. And incredibly powerful time. Bunny gave interviews to William Manchester for the death of the president, which I was allowed by the Manchester estate and Bunny's estate to use in the book. And Bunny just talked about what an incredible couple days it was and meeting with Jackie and Jackie having to relive the assassination and how, it, how traumatic it was for her. Um, again, the women remained close for life um, in New York, in Paris, um, in every kind of important moment, whether it was Caroline's wedding, they were, they were best friends. They could share each other's secrets. Um, and here are some, uh, Jackie would later go down and stay with Bunny, ride her horse um, to the place, and Jackie was, Bunny was by Jackie's side when Jackie later died. <coughs> but while this relationship was going really well, and I'm oh sorry, um, this is Bunny at her rather gorgeous garden, and while the romance, um, romance, I'm a little tired today, forgive me. <laughs> I'm about to tell you about a romance. While the relationship between the two women really was going well, Paul and her husband, um, Paul, hi, my name is Meryl Gordon. I'm a writer. <laughs> um, Paul began having a long-running affair with a woman named Dorcas Harden, you will see in this picture. Dorcas had a dress town in Georgetown, in, George, in Georgetown. 
Um, what can I say? Today's my birthday. I'm a little scattered. <laughs> I was going to tell you at the end, but you know. Um, anyhow, let's see if we can get through this. Um, uh, Dorcas was a widow, three children, uh, was really beloved. All the senators, wives, and congresswomen shopped at her store. Jamie, last night, Kapler told me that he knew her. Um, this wasn't just a brief affair. This was a 30-year romance. And everybody knew. Um, Bunny's son even said, oh, yes, we all knew that Dorcas was with, my, you know, with, my, with Paul on Tuesdays, and Bunny had him on Sundays. Um, at the National Gallery, they talked about how, you know, Bunny would be there with Paul and Dorcas would be there, and everybody tried not to say anything. But it was clearly also very painful I found for Bunny. I found a um, diary excerpt in which she wrote, um, and this is her with Givenchy, who became her, her, one of her closest friends right around the same time. But she's, she wrote about this diary entry, feel pretty and protected in this armor of a dress that Hubert designed for me. Tonight I will go to the National Gallery and the other woman will be there. Um, but, you know, she, they led separate lives for about 30 years. Um, Givenchy, as you know, recently died. Bunny was very much in love with him, but Givenchy had a longtime male companion. He and Bunny and Philippe traveled together, spent a lot of time together. Bunny did have a lot of men in her life, but most of them were gay but she was perfectly happy to enjoy their companionship. Um, what's interesting is towards the end of Paul Mellon's life, he and Bunny became close. And one of the things that brought them back together was the new design of the East Wing of the National Museum in Washington. They both fell in love with I.M. Pei. And they, uh, oh, here's Bunny in Antigua, one of her favorite places. Um, Bunny Moore in Antigua. Um, and Bunny in her library. And this is, uh, you know, this is the opening of the National Gallery with uh, I am Pei and Bunny and Paul. Now, I see that my light is about to go out, so I'm going to try to be really quick uh, before they cut me off. But um, when Bunny, uh, after Paul died in 1999, he left Bunny with $110 million and all of those estates. Now, show of hands, could you have lived happily on $110 million? <coughs> Bunny went through all of that money in five years. But as you remember, she had, um, she had those Rothkos. She borrowed against the Rothkos. The Rothkos kept her going for the last part of her life. Um, and the final thing I wanted to tell you, um, I told you that Bunny had planned her funeral. I told you that she was very angry that her father wouldn't let her go to college. She had ballroom after ballroom of couture clothing but she chose to be buried in a uh, graduation gown that she'd been given for an honorary degree at RISD. I love that. It was like, Dad, I made it. Um, so if, if they don't cut me off, I'm happy to take a question or two if anybody has anything they'd like to ask. All the way in the back. Yeah. I'm literally about to sign a book contract. My agent sent me the note yesterday, but I think I'm not supposed to say, but hopefully soon. But yes, it is someone else who I hope you will have heard of. Um, <laughs> thank you. Mm.